Hello, I'm Steve Bartlett. I'm chairman of the Board of Respectability, and I'm here with Michael Morris, the uh, the founder, brains, motivator, uh, uh, for, former executive director, but now acting executive director of the uh, disability uh, uh, of, the, of the Disability Institute. Um, and uh, he's quite storied in these in these parts. And so we're going to have a seminar, a uh, webinar. I'm sorry on uh, CRA, on the changes that are being proposed for CRA, what you can do about it to improve CRA and to at long last include uh, persons with disabilities in, the, in, the, in, in, in CRA act activities uh, officially. I think we've been included for a, a lot by many banks, uh, but it hasn't been official. So we're proposing to make it, uh, to make it official. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm going to, uh, Michael, do you have any opening words before we go on to the, to the deck? Or you're, you're gonna dry the deck. So we'll, we'll turn it over to Michael. Yes, um, Steve, thank you and, and thank uh, everyone at, at Respectability um, for your work and uh, your efforts uh, to really improve understanding awareness of um, what a world of possibilities can look like for people with disabilities, um, whether it's a family raising children with disabilities, working age adults, and, and uh, even people in retirement. Um, this topic is of the most greatest importance to me. Uh, and I am hopefully going to take my passion and, and bring my passion to you that takes us from passion to really a sense of activism about a topic that just simply uh, most people in the disability community have not heard a lot about, have not spent a lot of time on. So. Uh, over the next uh, half hour, 45 minutes, I want to explain to you the Community Reinvestment Act and why it matters for people with disabilities. This is both a conversation and really, I hope, a call to action. Next slide, please. So a little bit about the organization I started 15 years ago, National Disability Institute. Um, next slide, please. The mission of the organization is to drive social impact, to build a better economic future for people with disabilities and their families. We do that through research, advocacy work, policy development, public education, and probably most importantly of all, we have built very, very important bridges between the financial community and the disability community. Next slide, please. In 2000, there really was not another disability organization that really was tackling what are fundamental issues to people with disabilities and their families in this country. And that are issues of poverty. Millions of people with disabilities are confronted by poverty every day, whether it's uh, challenges related to simply having a meal, uh, a roof over your head, uh, the, the wide scale unemployment, uh, the lack of ability to pay for uh, just basic ne life necessities. Poverty has been uh, too much a part of the lives of millions of people with disabilities in this country. I started an organization to try to look at what we can do in policy, what we can do in terms of collaboration between government, the financial community and the disability community to change that picture. NDI today has about 35 staff. Staff are located around the country. We're headquartered here in Washington, DC. And uh, in any given year, we, we are typically in some stage of development of about 15 different projects. Next slide, please. I wanted to also share with you before we dive into the subject today around Community Reinvestment Act to let you know that about a year ago, a little over a year ago, I started a new center at National Disability Institute called the Center for Disability Inclusive Community Development. You know, every, every field, every community has its own language. In the disability community, we have acronyms like ADA. In the banking community, they have the acronym CRA. And, and we're gonna be talking about that today. Um, it's important for all of us to understand that CRA can be and will be over the next 10 years, I believe, as important as the ADA has been in the lives of millions of Americans with disabilities. Next slide, please. 
This center that we created, the Center for Disability Inclusive Community Development, you can find more material on the NDI website. If you wanna learn more about the subject and about the meaning of the words financial inclusion, we started a podcast series, had some really interesting leaders in the financial and disability community sit down with me and we have 30 minute podcasts that uh, can help you learn about this topic. And then really the seminal article that uh, I did uh, now um, uh, about a year and a half ago it, and was published uh, in the Georgetown Journal on Poverty Law and Policy, Journal of their law school is called Closing the Disability Gap, Reforming the Community Reinvestment Act. And uh, I'd urge you to take a look at that. You'll find it also on the NDI website where we have our material related to inclusive community development. Next slide, please. So let's get to the subject uh, at hand. Um, 40 years ago, I know for some of you, you weren't even born 40 years ago. Uh, for Steve and I, we were around. We were there at that point in time. Uh, 40 years ago, Congress passed CRA to encourage banks to serve low and moderate income neighborhoods and people as a response to a documented practice of redlining. So here's another one of those, those words, maybe not familiar to a lot of us. What redlining is or was about was banks drawing a circle around certain neighborhoods and basically saying, if you're going to live in that neighborhood, we're not so sure you're a risk we want to take on in terms of offering you a mortgage so you can buy a home in that neighborhood. So literally they drew a red line around those neighborhoods. Those neighborhoods were predominantly neighborhoods where low moderate income people were living and they were predominantly neighborhoods where people of color were living. So Congress reacted to that and passed the Community Reinvestment Act. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about what that is and then we'll move on to understanding how that should influence and impact all of us in the future. In 2019, more than 27% of working age people with disabilities were below the poverty level. That's 2019, that's pre-COVID. So that's before the, the, the horrific set of events that have transpired this year. Um, and what you see too is that um, the majority, uh, not the majority, but almost the majority of people with disabilities are, are, are a great percentage of people living in long-term poverty in this country. Although people with disabilities make up a significant portion of low and moderate income people who have always for 40 years been the target of the Community Reinvestment Act, they have not been a target of financial investment, lending, and service activities under CRA. There have been isolated uh, examples, but they have not been a focus of the regulators in their evaluating bank performance. They have not been a focus of the community development officers at banks thinking about, well, what should we do to meet CRA obligations? And so I don't think by any means it was intentional it wasn't intentional. It was simply out of sight, out of mind, not in the focus of the financial community. Next slide, please. Let's put this in a historical context. Again, many of you may not have been around back in 1977 when CRA was signed into law by Congress, but let's think back to 1977 in terms of where were people with disabilities in this country at that time? Well, um, I, I, I will still think of you as Congressman Bartlett because that's the way back in those years we, you, you know, we would deal with the notion that children didn't have the opportunity even to attend their neighborhood schools. The law first came into being in uh, 1975. And so it was for the first time when CRA was signed into law that families could take their child with a disability, with their child without a disability, and they could go to their same neighborhood school. If you go back 40 years, hundreds of thousands of people with disabilities were still being segregated in public hospitals, sometimes called uh, 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 institutions, public state institutions. 
the people with disabilities hadn't committed a crime. These were not prisons, but they might have well have been prisons in terms of the type of care that was not being provided, uh, the lack of treatment that led to a whole series and flurry of uh, litigation and, and court decisions well before the ADA was passed in 1990. And then of course, in 1977, we didn't have a civil rights law like the ADA defining protection against discrimination uh, in all that anyone does in, in a community, in the workplace, in the classroom. There was no right to equal opportunity. So that's a context of where CRA came into being. It wasn't about disability. It really was about low moderate income people being discriminated against and getting access to a mortgage so that they could buy a home in particular neighborhoods. Next slide, please. Well, I think we all recognize each in our own way, whether you're a person with a disability, whether you're an employer, whether you're a brother, a sister, a grandparent, whoever you are, societal norms really have changed related to people with disabilities. I think most people would certainly point to the Americans with Disabilities Act as singularly what brought about really the most uh, momentum for change. But what we now see, and I'll look at this pre-COVID because this year of course has brought so much hardship to so many millions of uh, people with and without disabilities. But pre-COVID, students with disabilities in record numbers were graduating from high school they were going into the workforce and many types of new jobs. State education agencies required under IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, have to report on the graduation rate of students with disabilities. It was going up every year. Uh, percentage was going up, going on to higher education or becoming employed. All good, very positive things. And then in terms of the ABLE Act, Achieving a Better Life Experience Act, we now have today almost 100,000 individuals with disabilities and their families have opened these tax advantage savings accounts. They have over, uh, right now, I believe over $500 million growing in these investment accounts that can cover for individuals and their families the extra cost of living with a disability. And I think we would all recognize pre-COVID people with disabilities are no longer bystanders, are no longer irrelevant. They're participants in the growth of the economy as consumers, as savers, as investors, as borrowers, and in growing numbers even becoming small business owners, becoming entrepreneurs, and also uh, working as independent contractors. I know for those of us who live in Washington DC, pre-COVID, how many times I've gotten into a Lyft or an Uber in Washington DC to find that my driver is deaf because there's a sizable deaf community. And so that was a great new means of employment for uh, individuals from the deaf community, often who are here because of Gallaudet University. Next slide, please. So what does all this mean? Context, 40 years ago, this law passed. Not a lot happened related to people with disabilities but a lot happened in our society related to continued understanding of the, the right to protect against discrimination, the right for um, equal opportunity, the right to participate in our economy. And so that brings us into focus CRA. So CRA is actually something that has three different types of financial regulators, three different federal agencies. The Office of Control of the Currency, the Federal Reserve Board of Governors and the FDIC, Federal Depositors Insurance Corporation. On this slide, what you'll see is actually uh, a link that will take you to the list of banks that each of these federal regulators has ahead over the next quarter, over the next uh, six months. It's also a place where you can find more information about well, what has happened in the past year or two years in terms of evaluating bank performance? Next slide, please. CRA performance evaluations. Um, the reason there are three different regulators is um, has to do with the size of banks and each regulator has a different portfolio of banks.
But I'm going to stay with us first with the large banks, because they are much larger than most of the other banks, uh, the top 20, top 30 banks in this country. And they're regulated by the Office of Control of the Currency and subject to three tests under CRA. They look at lending, investment, and service. Next slide, please. So what are we talking about with lending? So what the, the bank examiner from OCC, who's going to come to that community where uh, one of these major large banks are, and they're going to look at the number and amount of loans in that bank's assessment area, where the bank's physical presence is, where their branches are. They're going to, rec they're going to look at a record of lending to borrowers, not just of moderate and high wealth, they're going to look across all income levels as part of the CRA test because it was supposed to be about increased activity for low and moderate income people. They're going to look at the number and amount, complexity, and innovativeness of community development loans. That could be for housing. That could be for starting businesses. It could be for a lot of different types of activity. Next slide, please. Under the investment test, a pretty similar area dollar amount, complexity, and responsiveness of qualified community development investments. And here again, every year, each bank in your local community and across the country uh, has to make very hard decisions on how much money they're going to spend to meet CRA obligations and what are they going to spend it on. And there, I can assure you, are a lot more good ideas and good projects and, and, and unmet needs in every local community across this country. But there are also a lot of banks. And each bank is making decisions uh, every year about what they're going to do to meet CRA obligations. Next slide, please. And then, of course, the third part of this testing by OCC is about the availability and effectiveness of retail banking services in that local assessment area where that physical footprint, those retail branches are. Next slide, please. So what's the purpose of this performance evaluation? Um, for large banks, it typically is happening every three years. The purpose of OCC looking at large banks performance is to assess whether that bank is serving the convenience and needs of the community where they're located with a particular focus on low and moderate income populations. Now, remember my earlier slide, disproportionately represented in low and moderate income populations, some 40% in virtually every community in this country are going to be people with disabilities who are poor, but also disabled. And in many cases are also people of color. Next slide, please. So there's a four tier rating system. Uh, there's a written evaluation the bank examiners provide a bank every three years. The ratings are outstanding, satisfactory, needs to improve or substantial non-compliance. Over the past more than 10 years, 90% of banks have received the top two ratings. And that's really led to many community advocates for years pushing for tougher evaluations more comprehensive reviews, getting more into the data and into the details. Are they really serving? Is this bank really serving low and moderate income people? Next slide, please. Uh, why does all this matter to the disability community? So if, if I've bored you with details and complexity of another three letter acronym, you know ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, but I want you in the future to know CRA, Community Reinvestment Act. Here's why all this matters. In 2018, federally regulated banks spent over $480 billion. That's with a B, that's not million, that's billion dollars meeting CRA obligations. CRA investments in local communities were responding to diverse needs including housing and small business development, workforce development, financial counseling and financial education, even expansion of broadband and technology access and many other types of economic development activities. So do the simple math with me. If just 1% of what banks spent in 2018, I, 
I use 2018 because I don't have more current figures yet available for 2019. And obviously we don't know yet for 2020. But if 1%, you can do the math of $480 billion were dedicated to economic activities that benefited low moderate income people with disabilities, you get a figure of $4 billion. Think about what $4 billion buys in workforce development, getting people the skills and training they need to be in the workforce, good paying jobs with career pathways. What does it mean in terms of uh, accessible and affordable housing for people with disabilities? What does it mean for all those who want to uh, be business owners, entrepreneurs, starting their own small businesses, to, whether it's seed money to start up or it's money to grow their business and hire other people with and without disabilities, $4 billion buys a lot of things. 1%, 1% change gets you $4 billion of economic development activity targeted to people with disabilities. Next slide, please. So despite disproportionate high poverty rates among people with disabilities, it wasn't until just a few months ago uh, and the first regulations of CRA came out in 1978, no subsequent regulations, no policy interpretations until about two months ago ever said anything about low moderate income people with disability. And the Bible, the, the data set, pace setter, for financial institutions, the Federal Financial Institutions Examinations Council, which provides banks data on the LMI neighborhoods in their footprint, includes data on, on, on gender, on race, but it does not yet include information on disability. Next slide, please. So just a few data points uh, to help banks think about this is some of the comparison when we look at this intersectionality of race, ethnicity, and disability, you see that the higher poverty rates for people who are black versus people who are black with disabilities, again, you see, you begin to see the differential uh, uh, statistics. And you here the next bullet is, is really the one that is, is the most overwhelming. Across all racial and ethnic groups, Households with a disabled working age householder have lower net worth compared to households without a disability member. And it's 14,000 versus 83,000. But look what happens when it's a household with the persons are black and also there's a person with a disability. It drops all the way down to $1,282. For Latinx households, $13,000. So what, what you see is some really dramatic statistics, important statistics that should help drive bank decision-making in the future, particularly right now. And I'll tell you banks I work with, JP Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, they all in recent months have announced billion dollar commitments to people of color as they should to try to promote greater uh, equality and, and equity. In, uh, in terms of economic, you know, overcome economic disparity. But they're missing the point of this intersectionality of race, ethnicity, and disability. Next slide, please. So what's our challenge? And why are we all listening today and trying to figure this out? Without identifying people with disabilities as part of the LMI population, banks will continue to overlook the specific needs of this population. What we know is, Banks could be starting this year and every year in the future be spending money to help people with disabilities develop affordable and accessible housing, start up capital for entrepreneurs, expand financial education and counseling programs, improve access to technology. How many people with disabilities are sitting in a place where they live without broadband access? That could be changed or without the hardware and software that they need, that could be changed. And here's a really interesting one. It's, it's projected that maybe as many as half the states in this country will not be able to pull down the full federal share of dollars to 
because they don't have either a public or a private match to pull that money down. So here's what's amazing. For every dollar the state can put up towards uh, uh, VR services, they can pull down $3.75 of um, uh, federal dollars towards VR, workforce development, uh, skills development, uh, anything related to helping people achieve an employment outcome. So if a bank put up a million bucks, it would come with it if its purpose was to help a state who needed a match, it's 1 million could bring 3.75 million federal dollars with it. Quite, quite a, an advantage. Next slide, please. So I just want you to be aware on June 5th, OCC published its final rule, which uh, its goal was to strengthen and modernize CRA. The rule takes effect, uh, took effect on uh, October 1st. Uh, of this year. For the first time in 40 years, the rule makes specific reference to LMI individuals with disabilities and includes for the first time specific list of CRA qualifying activities for bank investment and lending related to targeting of people with disabilities. Over 1,500 commenters uh, uh, were submitted, comments submitted to OCC, uh, NDI, and about 90 other groups, including some banks supported us in getting disability added for the first time. And OCC listened and did it. Next slide, please. Uh, the final rule keeps CRA a relevant and powerful tool for supporting communities, uh, promoting civil rights through greater economic opportunity. Next slide, please. So here's three of the examples of what um, uh, the, uh, the new rule, OCC rule has. Uh, a way a bank could spend money that would qualify for CRA credit, financial capability training by bank employees for people with disabilities, consumer loans for households uh, that need assistive technology products or vehicle modifications to improve um, accessibility. And then a third, the one I was talking about related to vocational rehabilitation, funding for workforce development programs designed to improve employment opportunities for low MI, LMI people with disabilities. Next slide, please. And here are some examples, not specific to disability, but also people with disabilities could benefit. Consumer loans to fund unexpected medical expenses, grants to nonprofit to increase dig digital literacy training, to increase use of online banking services, loans to nonprofits to develop affordable and accessible housing, in-kind donation of computer equipment. So here's just a short list of some of the things that could be done under CRA that would benefit people with disabilities. Next slide, please. What can you do as an individual and organization? Think about unmet needs of LMI people that would match qualifying CRA activity. Sit down and talk with where you bank Learn about what are they doing in the CRA planning process. Find out when their next CRA bank examination is going to take place. Find out whether you and they can sit down together and, and talk about there might be some joint activities that uh, would actually engage CRA funding in the future. Um, you can contact C, uh, the Center for Disability Inclusive Development to learn more. Uh, about training and technical assistance activities. Next slide, please. So that was OCC. On October 19th, just a few, really just a week ago, um, the Federal Reserve System put out their own CRA role in the Federal Register. Why are they seeking change? To more effectively meet the needs of all moderate income communities increase clarity and consistency and transparency of bank examinations, promote community engagement, take into account in banking what banks are doing beyond just their physical footprint, as many people do their banking online across the country, and meet the wide range of low moderate income banking needs and address inequities in financial services and credit access. There can't be any greater inequities than what, what goes on in terms of people with disabilities and, and their lack of access to financial services. Next slide, please. 
what the proposed comments offer people with disabilities. So I went through hundreds of pages of this proposed rule, seeing did they, did they replicate what OCC had done? And unfortunately they hadn't, they had only one thing. For large banks, they should evaluate branch-based services, including um, what is necessary in terms of disability accommodations. Now we wanna support that in their final rule writing, but they need to do a lot more. Next slide, please. So I've pointed out in, in this next set of slides, they ask in the proposed rule, a set of questions. The first question is, how should the Federal Reserve define community services? And you could propose ways community services could actually include services that benefit low moderate income people with disability. They also ask, how can a bank determine whether an activity meets the needs of low or moderate income people? And here again, you could say an agent's the activity is targeted to recipients of federal disability programs, such as benefits counseling, vocational rehabilitation. I could add here special education, youth and transition services, housing assistance and others. Next slide, please. Should workforce development be included as a separate prong of the economic development definition? So they asked this question in the proposed rule. And again, you wanna respond by saying yes and, and define it in a way that it definitely includes people with disability. They also asked what are ways that banks should encourage access to credit for underserved or economically distressed minority communities? And here again is a way that we can put in language to say, when a bank's performance is being evaluated, please look at the level and type of efforts to improve credit and access to other community service activities to meet the needs of low moderate income individuals with disabilities. One more slide, please. And should FRB like OCC publish a list uh, that would not be the only list, but at least a starting point. And again, I think we should answer back, of course, because we wanna get in the kinds of activities that could support people with disabilities. Next slide, please. And then finally, how can the public be more engaged in a bank's strategic plan development? And again, they could indicate that the bank must show in its strategic plan development that they engage the disability community. Uh, community uh, nonprofits that are serving or advocating on behalf of people with disabilities should be a part of what uh, is in this bank strategic plan development. Next slide, please. What data should a bank collect and share with bank examiners? And again, uh, that one shouldn't just look at LMI as one homogeneous group of people uh, because there are really many subgroups defined by race, ethnicity, gender, and of course, disability. And so really we'd like to see the kind of data be collected that we really could evaluate a bank's performance. What are they doing for LMI people with disabilities? Next slide, please. So here is the information that I take, I hope you'll take to mind. You can get, uh, you can find the actual full notice of proposed rulemaking in the Federal Register from the Federal Reserve Bank system. Comments are due February 21. So you have, you have months to think of this, think about this, work at this. Um, uh, this slide tells you where you can mail in your comments or email in your comments. And then if you really wanna understand this more, I'd urge you to take a look at an article Actually, it was a speech made by Governor Lyle Brainerd, who's a member of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors on why we need to strengthen CRA. Next slide, please. So I, I've covered a lot of ground. At times I've gone pretty deep. Uh, I know respectability will make these slides available to you. Um, next slide, please. Uh, Visit the Keys to Financial Inclusion podcast series. Here's a list of uh, people that uh, were the first set of guests. Next slide. And I, I leave you with this closing quote from Zadie Smith. I think for all of us in the disability community, progress is never permanent. It's always being threatened. We as a community must be redoubled, restated, and reimagined in our efforts 
if we are going to survive. So um, I'll close there and turn it back to, to you, Steve, and others. Wow. And, uh, uh, just uh, Michael, please, that, was, that was brilliant. That was brilliant. Uh, and, and, it, and you gave us an exact blueprint on what to do. I, I might say, and I, I, I should have said this even more fully at the beginning, Michael Morris is regarded as an icon in the disability uh, community, and particularly for promoting financial inclusion for persons with disabilities, empowerment, banking services, financial services, uh, and, and entrepreneurs. Uh, so he has, he has opened the door for us. And now that we've, we have the proposal from the OCC and hopefully the, F, the Federal Reserve, we can add the, the additional tool of CRA. If I could, so I'm not gonna summarize everything Michael said. The, the, these, these suggestions will be on our website at respectability and also at the uh, National Disability Inst Institute. But if I could sort of close down with what he said, and that is er everyone on this call and everyone you know, and everyone in all of the disability organizations are called upon to take two steps and don't wait until February 20, 21st, uh, do it now. First is send your comment to the OCC uh, supporting their their proposed regulation, it was a major step to get uh, to get the OCC to uh, to include that uh, the disability community in the regulations. And then second is send to the Federal Reserve your comment and be explicit to basically say to the Federal Reserve, you know, get with the program, guys, you know, get on the stick. Your your colleagues at the they they will be jealous that their colleagues at the OCC have gotten ahead of them. So use that jealousy a bit to say get 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 with the program, and suggest specific things that the disability that the banks could do uh, to provide financial support, financial help um, to uh, uh, to persons with disabilities who are also LA, low low moderate income. Uh, I might say that. Um, the, the, there are several areas. Employment is a big one, um, and there are barriers to employment, as everyone knows. I would parenthetically, uh, I must acknowledge that one of the barriers to employment is, con is contained in federal law. Just as redlining was originally a feature of federal law, which is the banks implemented it, but the FHA were the ones that drew the red line around the maps that gave them to the banks. So there was a certain complicity there. But, uh, but, but now federal law has this asset cap, which is excruciatingly painful and unfair and stupid. Basically, it says that if you're, on, if you're eligible for SSI or SSDI, you are required by law to always be poor. You can never have more than $2,000 in assets and uh, is probably the stupidest, most counterproductive thing in federal law that we could imagine, but there it sits. So that's, that's the subject, by the way, for congressional action next, uh, next, uh, next year. But right now the banks are providing financial services to help employment, to provide uh, sometimes technology, sometimes hardware, uh, sometimes accessibility, sometimes financial um, uh, fin entrepreneurship, sometimes financial uh, literacy uh, counseling, open that to the world of persons with disabilities. So one thing is send your comment letters right now to the Federal Reserve and to the OCC. OCC is out of boy and Federal Reserve is get with the program. Second, everybody in the disability community has a bank, either a banking relationship, hopefully you should, uh, or if not, at least a bank in your neighborhood. Uh, so that the organizations do and the individuals do. So pick up the phone, uh, go online and ask to speak with the CRA director for that bank. Um, you might be the first one that week or that year to, to ask for that, but they will, they, will, they will contact you. They will say, what do you want? Say, I want to know. How can, how can we work together to improve access to banking services for people with disabilities because that is now required in the CRA. And when you say CRA, that's like holding up a, you know, a hatchet you know, to, uh, over their heads or a baseball bat over their heads to, to be less gory, a baseball bat to say, you, you have to do this to comply with CRA and then say, and let me and our organization and other disability advocates help you in complying with CRA and you'll get their attention. Uh, Michael, is that, it, by the way, if, if you can't meet the CRA officer, ask to speak with the, with the branch manager. Go in and say, you're the branch manager. What are you doing to comply with CRA for people with disabilities? Because Mr. and Mrs. Branch, branch manager, it is now required. Congratulations. Michael, is that uh, pretty, you what you wanted to do? <laughs> I think you summarized it very, very well. And uh, uh, I guess maybe be forewarned uh, banks, whether it's the branch manager or otherwise, uh, are not going to be uh, enthusiastic about your, your meeting. 
um, they they uh, may maybe uh, a little put off, but be be persistent, but right. but not argumentative. Be right. be. I mean, you have you're entitled to be a part of the process. Uh, every bank needs to seek public input in their development of uh, uh, their. Uh, if they do develop a strategic plan, it's not absolutely required. Um, but they're, they, they really are there to serve their community. That's how banks succeed. And, and you know, be, be, po be polite, but, but persistent. Uh, uh, the banks are not your enemies. Uh, you want to make them your more active friends, but they're not your enemies. So, uh, and then offer to help. Say what, at the in, end of your meeting, say, what can I do to help, um, help you, the bank, comply with CRA for people with disabilities? Uh, and, I, and I think I can, I can help you. So it doesn't take a big movement it takes obviously if you can bring five people with you instead of just one that's better but if you just bring one that's uh, uh that that's enough and uh and be helpful but helpful towards achieving the, the result and uh uh and and the numbers are staggering the banking the banking industry uh you know finances everything that moves and so they may as well finance people with disabilities and then they'll and they'll want to do it i don't i don't think you'll you'll find hostility if if you're not hostile, I think you'll find a friendly, uh, friendly reception. And then send back what you find out. Send it back to respectability, uh, to me, Steve Bartlett, or to uh, disability of uh, uh, in dis dis disability with with Michael. And then um, tell us what you found out, and uh, and we'll we'll back you up. And this is uh, Philip. Uh, Con Polly, the Policy and Practices Director for Respectability, just jumping in here um, because we've got some time for questions. We have some questions that we want to cover, but we did get two questions from um, our chat box. Um, so if you are audience members, if you have a question that you'd like to ask, just type it away in the chat box, put in the Q&A option. And so the two questions that we have um, for Michael and for Steve is, you know, first of all, is it more helpful to have groups um, sign on to comments or just people submit individual testimony? So that's the first question. And the second question um, is that we have an election coming up, which means there's going to be a lot of new political appointments coming in uh, down the line. And so, you know, how can, you know, we as a disability community get more of our people into positions of decision-making authority on these and other critical issues? Uh, well, Michael, let me let me start start off and then turn it turn it to you. Uh, the answer to is it better to have groups or individuals comment? The answer is yes. <laughs> it's better to have groups and it's better to have individuals. But you're not you know just because you commented as a group doesn't mean you shouldn't comment as an individual. So they both count. Now, I was in Congress as, as you all know some time ago, but I can absolutely guarantee that the Federal Reserve and the OC and the and the OCC. They read every comment, and I mean they actually read it and underline what was said. And sometimes it takes a year to read all the comments if there are a lot of them. But and then they they count them up. They say, so if we got no comments supporting the disability inclusion, then we won't get disability inclusion. If we got two hundred thousand, then we will. So let's aim for two hundred thousand or, or more. But they do read the, they do read the, the, the comments, Michael. Yeah, I, 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 I love your answer because the answer is yes, yeah. both matter. And uh, um, uh, the, uh, uh, it, it's amazing. I, I, I know OCC got 1,500 comments. And as, as Steve said, they read every single one. They have to uh, put them into different categories to because there'll be people with different view, opposite views on the same issue. So numbers matter here. And yeah. um, uh, I, I, I would tell you, I never thought that OCC uh, would follow our comments, but I then didn't expect 90 different organizations, as they shared with me, had, had come in and backed up comments National Disability Institute had, had initially written, and, and that mattered. And, and it's, it's so, um, uh, talk to others, you know, as individuals, uh, uh, talk to your local bank, sell them on, 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 on this as a comment. I, I was very surprised. I, I mean, I think still the largest bank in the United States is JP Morgan Chase. And, and uh, I was on a call with uh, uh, some of their staff, lead people who work on community reinvestment, community development. And they told me for the first time they had taken some of my disability comments and included it in their comments. And when the largest bank in the country tells, you know, on top of a lot of disability groups, says, you know, 
we we have overlooked people with disabilities too long and it's time they are should be a part of what we're investing in and improving services for so do not think you are powerless you have tremendous power uh but there is power in numbers and we got to get the word out JP Morgan Chase has been very responsive on this issue and they, they followed the leadership of the National Disability Institute, but they actually stepped up to the plate and issued their own comments. I would say that the, uh, uh, that, that, well, let me move over to the next, next question. And that is that uh, how to get a political appointments. So uh, we at respectability, and I, I don't know if I th suspect National Disability Institute, we are in the, we are actually gathering resumes of persons with disabilities and submitting them to that will submit them to the new administration. I think we'll wait until after the polls close next Tuesday, but then then we're going to be submitting them and we will we will get them into the uh, flow of work and then see what what comes out and push them. So uh, you can send your resume to respectability or to Michael to National Disability Institute and uh, the more send it to both send it to both. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I love that question because it's a recognition that until people with disabilities are in decision-making positions, right. it's really hard to be heard. Nothing, um, nothing about us without us. And, and so uh, whether it's running for, uh, uh, running for Congress or it's being a political appointee and, and they'll, they'll uh, whether Trump gets reelected or, or Biden gets elected, they're, they're, Trump will be making huge changes. Biden will obviously be putting together a new administration. There'll be a lot of open positions. But what I love about this question is, it's not just about uh, who heads up uh, like Office of Disability Employment Policy or Office of Special Education, where we know disability is the primary focus. You wanna be over in areas like this, uh, or as I guess I would say where the money is, where decisions are being made about how money is used, uh, that's where we wanna be. And, and so um, there is, uh, Someday, someone with a disability will become a Federal Reserve Board of, on the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. Someday, they'll they'll become a, a, a member of the uh, the uh, key decision makers at FDIC. Uh, and uh, someday, maybe someone with a disability will head up OCC. But um, we just got to keep pushing forward because uh, you you see the kind of changes that are taking place in corporate America in terms of diversity and inclusion. Um, in the money side, in the regulatory side of banks, um, we, we've, we've, there's, there's only one way to go, and that's to get better, basically. Right. Absolutely. Right. Um, I'm just going to jump in Philip, and add. Philip, oh. Philip, before you move on, I do want to course, back up to the National Disability Institute was just magnificent in opening this door to get included in the, uh, in the regulations for CRA. But I, I should single out an individual congressman, Brad Sherman from California, who was the lead congressional sponsor to provide the congressional support for making it happen all, also. So National Disability Institute and Congressman Brad Sherman, the chairman of the relevant subcommittee had a lot to do with getting this, getting this done. Unfortunately, the Federal Reserve didn't, didn't read his comments as much as the SEC <laughs> did. Philip, I'm sorry, go ahead. What, what I was just going to jump in on and share is talking about kind of how the regulatory environment is changing and something that is really important to think about is there's a cross section here of, um, you know, banking institutions that have CRA obligations who are also federal contractors. Um, and that is really important because under Section 503 of the Rehabilitation Act as amended, um, those contractors have obligation have a goal to hire more people with disabilities to the point of having 7% of their workforce be people with disabilities. And so um, obviously we want to push on the CRA front, um, but these are, you know, institutions that are already by, by regulatory inter, um, intervention, you know, trying to promote greater inclusion of people with disabilities in their workforce. And so I think there's a lot of synergies to be brought across um, both the CRA space as well as the 503 space, especially with, you know, how many contractors are out there. So Philip and Michael, let me apologize. I, I just got an emergency phone call. I'm being pulled away for another Zoom, Zoom briefing, of course, but uh, so I'm going to leave, turn it back over to Michael and to, and to Philip to close it out. And uh, thank you all for being on the call. Thanks. Well, Michael, we have a few more moments. Um, and, you know, you and I have are both, both policy wonks. We've written lots of public comments. Um, 
and we're obviously encouraging members of the disability community to draft and submit their own comments. And I would ask you the question of what do you think makes for good public comments? What are the kinds of things that people should share, should link to, should include when they actually, you know, take the active step of writing out something and submitting it to the Federal Reserve or OCC? Yeah. Um, first, of course, submit comments, right? We, we, we got that message clearly from, uh, I still call him Congressman Bartlett. Um, and, uh, uh, but to your question is the more specific uh, you can be with recommended language. So it's not like include people with disabilities in your next uh, round of uh, when you write your final regulation in terms of the Federal Reserve uh, uh, Board of Governors is actually, as I've shared in the PowerPoint, very specific language. And uh, that, that makes it, you wanna make it easy for the regulation writers. You don't want, yes, we wanna get their attention on disability, but then make it easy for, well, how do we do that? So give them actual language that uh, again, specific to when you read, and I, I'm glad you put in the chat box, uh, Philip, uh, where you can send your comments as well as see the full document, um, because you'll see they ask very specific questions. I didn't even number them in my PowerPoint, but it will be, so question 27, uh, in your comments, put question 27 and then put your proposed answer. The more specific, the better. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Um, well, seeing no other questions from our audience, um, uh, I am going to exercise my convening authority and say, do you, Michael, do you have any final words? No, I, I just think um, this has uh, been a, a great opportunity. It, it, uh, it did a wonderful little thing for me. It forced me to get this PowerPoint ready, uh, which I, I will now use uh, multiple times with many other audiences uh, across the country. Um, but um, I think that uh, the power is in our numbers. We have the numbers. Millions of people are part of the disability community. We've, we've, we've really got to figure out how to mobilize that this enormous, very diverse community on very powerful opportunities like this. So I hope in the future, um, you ask a person with a disability today, what is the ADA? They know it's the Americans with Disabilities Act. In the future, when we ask people with disabilities, what's CRA? They're gonna say, oh, that's the Community Reinvestment Act. That's what finally began to give us economic opportunity in this country. All right, we will leave it there. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you so much to our audience. Um, Eric, our sign language interpreter, um, Bill, as well as our captionist, Christine, thank you all. And thank you all for joining us. And we hope that you have a great day. Join us. We welcome your involvement.